today. Dr. Mirza did his uh, undergraduate work at University of Central Florida uh, before going on to Eastern Virginia Medical School to complete his medical, medical studies. He was there influenced by Dr. Jean uh, Jean Peloton, who was very well known in vascular surgeon and moved on to do his integrated uh, vascular surgery studies at the Mayo Clinic. He was very well sought after, after he finished. Uh, very well published, well spoken. Uh, I've never thought I'd go to a meeting, a national meeting, and see someone with uh, three plenary session uh, talks. And, and uh, this past exam in Washington, D.C., I go there, I see him seven times with plenary talks. And I'm like, who's this guy? But I'm glad he's a partner. Uh, and I've been very pleased uh, with uh, all the partners that have been here and, and uh, taken care of Aleem. He's very much a team player, and he's adding so much to our division. Uh, please welcome Dr. Merce. Thank you, Dr. Manunga, for that. I'm not sure it's a deserved uh, introduction, but I, I really appreciate it. And as the junior most person probably in this room, um, it's, um, it's my great pleasure to be able to uh, speak to you today about a topic that I really, really enjoy. and. Um, um, I hope to continue working on with Dr. Mononga and, and um, the rest of uh, the group here. So I'll talk to you today about adjuncts during uh, fenestrated branched endovascular aortic repair, uh, predominantly um, upper extremity access and then some future directions and some projects that we're working on here. I have no financial disclosures. I think I'm, I was a resident six months ago, so it's a bit too early for that. Um, but um, <laughs> the... <laughs> The, uh, the cases and images you'll see here, I worked on with uh, uh, my mentor, Dr. Uh, Gustavo Oderich um, um, at Mayo Clinic. And so a lot of these cases we did together and a lot of, this, uh, a lot of these research uh, uh, papers we presented together. So we'll talk today a little bit about the history of fenestrate and branch technology. We'll go uh, on an overview of uh, adjuncts during FBVAR predominantly preloaded systems, upper extremity access. If we have time, we'll touch on a t the total femoral approach, which is uh, a new topic. Uh, we'll intermingle some case presentations so it doesn't become too monotonous. And then we'll touch on uh, some current research. So um, when looking at the uh, evolution of uh, fenestrated branch repair, um, in 1996, Dr. Park was actually the first person to perform a fenestrated repair where he incorporated a, an accessory renal artery uh, uh, for a juxtarenal aneurysm. Um, but most people start the timeline uh, with uh, uh, Tom Brown and his group in Perth, Australia, and at that time, um, uh, they uh, uh, performed a successful uh, fenestrated uh, repair in, in an animal model. Uh, later on in Adelaide, uh, Australia, John Anderson uh, uh, then took this and performed uh, uh, a single fenestration uh, um, repair for juxtarenal aneurysm. Um, and this uh, uh, repair, uh, he did not use any sort of alignment stent. Uh, later on, uh, uh, to be precise, the next year, Tom Brown and his group partnered with John Anderton, Anderson and uh, they later performed the first fenestrated repair with a, uh, um, an alignment branch 
or alignment stent. Um, and since then, we've uh, had significant uh, uh, progression. Um, here you can see Tim Shooter from San Francisco, who's famous for the T-branch device, um, and really pioneered and, and advocated for branch technology. And then uh, the, the famous uh, uh, Roy Greenberg from Cleveland Clinic, who um, uh, uh, was uh, probably the most uh, prolific and well-known pioneer of, uh, of fenestrated technology. And if you look at the options that we have now compared to the 1990s and e even uh, um, 2012 when the uh, uh, ZFEN was first FDA approved in America, we have uh, a number of devices. This actually is underrepresentative of all the devices we have. When we talk about devices, we talk about off-the-shelf devices, and the Cook Deep T branch is just one option. An off-the-shelf device would be a device that's uh, designed to uh, fit a um, uh, majority of people's anatomy. Um, in reality, that varies from anywhere between 80% with the T branch to 30% uh, to 40% with, with things like uh, P branch. Uh, so these are supposed to be options that you have um, on the shelf and you can use for patients who come in emergently, urgently, or, or um, because you don't have access to other devices. There's also uh, uh, the patient-specific option, and these are uh, mostly limited to uh, uh, places who have investigational device exemptions, um, and they can actually have uh, custom-manufactured devices made specifically for patient's anatomy with any combination of fenestrations or branches or any other method of uh, incorporating uh, renal and mesenteric vessels. Prior to all of this, we were doing these with uh, um, physician-modified endografts on the back table, and uh, uh, Dr. Monunga has much more experience than I do in this, but we did this quite frequently at, when I was at Mayo for training for patients who came in urgently and we couldn't order a device because uh, those options often take anywhere between six, uh, in those days, six and uh, 12 weeks. Nowadays, probably closer to six weeks. Um, so uh, these are the devices we have. Um, and when looking at implanting a fenestrated device, there are a number of different challenges and different things that make uh, uh, this case complex. One of the things that makes this case complex is that not only do you have to cannulate these target vessels, but first you actually have to get your wire out of a fenestration, and then you have to find your way into a target vessel. So the concept of preloaded wires or sometimes preloaded catheters uh, came about. And um, as you can see here, this is kind of just a little diagram showing that first you have to get into the, uh, the stent graft, then you have to get out of the fenestration, and then you actually have to find your way into a target vessel. So what I'd like to do is actually show you a case. Um, this was a case I presented uh, a year or two ago, uh, uh, kind of demonstrating how we manufacture devices uh, on the back table, or how we modify devices on the back table how we add preloaded wires, and then I'm going to show you a couple of examples of, of how these preloaded wires not only make uh, 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 the step of cannulating a fenestration easier, but uh, cases where preloaded wires are essential. So this was a 59-year-old female who presented with a 7-centimeter extent tooth arc abdominal aneurysm. She had a prior arch repair with an elephant trunk technique. Her cardiovascular risk factors are listed there. We actually planned for a staged uh, thoracoabdominal repair. Stage one would be a TVAR taking a thoracic stent graft down to the level of the uh, celiac axis. At this time, given that she had a, um, a chronic dissection, the uh, right renal artery came off the um, uh, false lumen. So there was a little re-entrance at that site or a, an opening through the septum of the, of the dissection. And we elected to, or we planned on uh, dilating that opening so that it would be easier to go back stage two and then cannulate uh, that renal artery. And then stage two, we planned for a patient-specific manufactured fenestrated and branched stent graft, which, as I mentioned, uh, would have to be six weeks later after, uh, after it had been manufactured in Australia and then, and then shipped to us. Uh, the idea is, uh, by staging this, not only would it give us time to um, have the device manufactured, but it also gives the patient time mm -hmm. Uh, to develop their collateral network to the spinal cord uh, and minimizes or, or, or lessens the risk of spinal cord ischemia. So this was stage one. Uh, we performed a, a, a TVAR down to the level of the celiac axis. And for stay, uh, also during stage one, you can see here that we had access into both the true and the false lumen. Um, we, had, uh, we used a re-entrance device to gain access at the level of the right renal artery. Um, and then we essentially balloon dilated this re-entrance so that when we came back 
gaining access to the right renal artery from the, false, from the true lumen into the false lumen would be uh, uh, much easier. So she was discharged after this uh, uh, operation on post-op day four, no complications. She was doing well. She unfortunately had two readmissions for chest pain and intermittent low extremity weakness, uh, almost paralysis. And I don't know if you can appreciate it here. Maybe this will play again. You can s actually see that the true lumen's completely collapsed now that the false lumen's been pressurized. And, and it's quite an impressive uh, um, picture here. This is a rotational DSA that we took. So um, we actually admitted her and uh, planned for an emergent repair. Uh, rather than waiting for a manufactured device, at this time we uh, elected to perform a four-vessel fenestrated uh, physician-modified endograph repair. Uh, we planned on using preloaded wires from the left brachial approach and then extending our repair distally with a bifurcated device as depicted in this uh, 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 illustration. So this is a video on how we modify the alpha. We do it very similarly here. Uh, we usually select a small tapered stent inside a larger sheath and then we unsheath the entire stent keeping that metallic cannula in place. Um, using a, a larger sheath allows room for modifications. We then utilize an ophthalmic electrocautery to carefully create these fenestrations, uh, usually keeping them around six by six millimeters. You have to take care not to set the graft fabric alight um, because this can happen. And here you can see a six by six millimeter fenestration. We then reinforce these with a double layer of uh, nitinol wire, and this is fixed in place with a uh, 5 locking ethabond suture, as you can see here. We utilize a, a 25 millimeter ensnare device to harvest the wire, and this is what we use to uh, reinforce the fenestration. Here you can see the completed fenestrations, and honestly, they look like manufactured devices. You can see the four gold markers on either side for orientation. We then add uh, uh, three vertically oriented markers uh, anteriorly at the 12 o'clock position, and then posteriorly at the 6 o'clock position on the stent graft, we add uh, three horizontally uh, uh, oriented markers. And this will allow for uh, intracorporeal and extracorporeal orientation of the device under fluoroscopy. We then add diameter reducing ties. And these are important because they allow the device to may remain partially constrained so that we can rotate it within the, within the body. So we start by uh, uh, incising that plastic cannula, exposes the inner 018 nitinol wire. This wire um, is very fragile, so we uh, uh, remove it with a, uh, a proline suture. We then use a spinal needle to weave in and out the posterior uh, graft fabric and thread that uh, nitinol wire through the graft fabric. And this allows us to use proline sutures uh, to add these uh, diameter reducing ties. It's a little bit uh, uh, more complex when you look at it, but it makes sense when you're doing this in, in the OR. Here you can see that we're uh, now securing these uh, diameter reducing ties. And this picture, you can see that the goal is to reduce the graft to two-thirds of its original size. And again, that allows for intracorporeal manipulation and twisting of the graft um, uh, based on tortuosity and, and to line up the fenestrations. We then add these preloaded wires. So we use 018 wires. They go into the graft and then out through the fenestrations. And then we push them back into the sheath of the uh, main devices depicted here. And this is uh, uh, just a video of how we did this in, in one of our many simulations that we did during training. So here you can see the wire coming out of the fenestration, and then it gets reloaded back into the, um, the sheath. We then uh, uh, resheath the device with several silk sutures or a stylastic vessel loop to protect the uh, delicate areas. And you should see here now uh, a completed device that has been um, completely resheathed with uh, four preloaded wires for all four fenestrations. So um, you can ignore the Mayo Clinic sign there. So post-operatively, the patient did really well. I um, uh, was in the ICU for four days. Uh, day one, we removed the spinal drain. Uh, day two, uh, we actually had to replace it uh, for 24 hours for some low extremity weakness. But ultimately, she was discharged on post-op day 10, neurologically intact, uh, and no change in her kidney function. So this is actually a, a case that I want to show you now, um, where we've kind of gone over why should we use preloaded wires? We've gone over how do we add these preloaded wires and, and what are they beneficial for? This is a case where preloaded wires are absolutely essential. And it's actually an extremely interesting case. So it's a 65-year-old male presented with aneurysm set growth in the setting of having a prior four-vessel fenestrated repair for a ruptured uh, thoracoabdominal aneurysm done in 2015. Now has had rapid growth of eight millimeters over the last seven months. No fevers, chills, night sweats, or anything to to, to suggest that she, uh, he's got an infection. 
also presents symptomatically with new thoracic back pain, and that's his uh, uh, prior medical history, including an open infrarenal repair. Uh, things to note on the physical exam, he was tachypneic, had some crackles, two plus pitting edema, um, and this is pre-op evaluation. Um, again, we got an indium labeled white blood cell scan to make sure there was no infection. Um, of note, and I hope maybe Dr. Skake will notice this, the platelets were 52,000. So going over preoperative imaging, um, on day zero, um, when he presented, his uh, uh, maximum diameter was 82 millimeters. After repair, four months after repair, uh, had shrunk to 70 millimeters. 28 months after repair, um, not too much change, was at 74 millimeters. Um, now at 35 months, has grown to 89 millimeters. Now to 100 millimeters. And at 45 months, he's at 103 millimeters. Now, during this time period, he's had multiple CT scans, multiple delayed phase imaging, uh, had it reviewed by the head of uh, vascular radiology. No one can find any source of endoleak, any source of, uh, uh, of um, bleeding into the sac to cause um, sac growth, but it's growing. Uh, so we elected to try a different type of study, and we tried a contrast-enhanced ultrasound um, we did two of these, and sometimes with a CT, um, due to the phase, you may not see um, you may not see the endoleak. We tried with contrast enhanced ultrasound twice, and still we could not see any definite endoleak to suggest that there was any sort of reason for the sac to be growing. So we obtained one more CT scan, and this ended up being our preoperative CT scan. You can see these axial cuts, CT angiogram. Thoracic aorta is of normal caliber. You get down, you see the proximal uh, stent graft has good apposition. The uh, celiac and SMA fenestrations are uh, patent. There's no type 3 endoleak or 1, 1C endoleak here. But you see here that there are new blood, uh, fresh blood products within the aneurysm sac. And the same thing is actually seen on the non-contrast images, which I haven't shown to you. Um, and so we became very suspicious that either there was uh, a very delayed type 2 endoleak that we weren't seeing, a type 4 endoleak. Um, and one thing we suspected is because he had a physician-modified repair it, uh, from the outset, you know, we modify these, we put sutures in these grafts. Is there some tiny little leak through a, a needle hole that's bleeding into the aneurysm sac and causing this occult uh, uh, endoleak and aneurysm <laughs> sac growth? So now it's 45 months. This guy's really debilitated. I told you his physical exam. Um, family's not sure if they want to do anything. He's now grown from 103 millimeters to 108 millimeters at 46 months. He's also symptomatic. So we had a, a long discussion with the family, um, and they, they really wanted us to try and do something. Um, he really didn't want to rupture. He, he, was, he was terrified to die. So when we look at, looked at his platelet trend, you can see, starting in March 2015, when he initially presented, his platelets were normal, and now they're down to 50,000. Um, when we looked at this, we wondered, you know, is there some sort of uh, a DIC process going on, consumptive process going on with uh, blood products entering the aneurysm sac and, and, and platelets being consumed? Um, and we'll look at the trend postoperatively as well. So in, in summary of his imaging, and this is where preloaded wires come into play, um, as well as uh, uh, something called inner branches, you can see that really the uh, diameter of the aorta now, the effective diameter is quite small, because the effective diameter is the, the inside of the stent graft, which at the SMA and the celiac measures anywhere between 20 and 30 millimeters. It doesn't allow you a lot of room in the aneurysm sac uh, uh, to manipulate a wire and search for your target vessels. So the solution we came up with, and by we, I mean Dr. Odrich, um, we uh, decided to do a reline the entire stent graft, because we couldn't find where the, where the, where the, um, the endoleak was coming from. We couldn't identify a definite endoleak, but we knew that there were blood products within the, within the sac. So a four-vessel uh, uh, physician-modified repair. We utilized inner branches. Now, inner branches uh, don't have any external component. Um, but without going into too much detail, they allow you a bit more freedom to uh, fish around for your target vessels than a traditional fenestration where you have to line the fenestration up perfectly with the prior fenestration or directional branches which have an external component and really wouldn't work too well when you have limited diameter. Um, and the reason we used one fenestration is just because uh, uh, some of the target vessels were close together. So uh, this is a very similar video. I'm going to skip this video. Um, 
and go straight to the repair. So we performed this repair in our hybrid operating room at Mayo, which utilized the GE Discovery IGS-740. We obtained bilateral percutaneous femoral access uh, and then open surgical access of the right brachial artery. After we had uh, established wire uh, access, we then utilized an indie snare to gain through and through brachial femoral access and advance the 12 French golf like sheath into the mid descending thoracic aorta. We performed staggered deployment just below the celiac branch, and then you can see we're fishing around and we've gained access into the celiac, uh, the previous celiac stent. Uh, then we performed staggered deployment below the SMA and gained access into the SMA stent. The steps that you don't really see here are that. Instead of, a fish, instead of fishing around for our fenestrations of the new device and then getting out through our old device, with a preloaded wire, we were able to advance a sheath straight over that wire, out through our fenestrations, and then at that point, we just had to use a catheter and a wire to get out through into the target vessels, and it really eliminated a lot of steps um, that probably weren't going to be possible given all of this medical artifact. And I think you can appreciate there are so many stents that are already in place. Trying to see where your wire is is going to be next to impossible. So that was a really important component uh, of the repair. And I don't think we would have completed the repair without having these preloaded wires. So here you can see we deployed the device. We've got wires into all of our target vessels. We start with target vessel incorporation, the left renal artery. A uh, technical point for the vascular surgeons in the room here is that we use a Viaban stent graft, which is a self-expandable cupboard stent graft. Usually jumps when you try to deploy it. You can see that we've withdrawn the sheath only halfway over the stent graft. We then pull the trigger on a uh, trigger wire on the Viaban. It partially deploys, uh, and then you withdraw the sheath, and it allows for a very accurate deployment of the Viaban stent graft. And you can see uh, here we are actually reinforcing uh, uh, with an ICAST stent proximally, which is a balloon expandable cupboard stent. And then this gets post dilated. And then after this, uh, completion angiogram shows a widely patent repair, no endo leak. We repeated the exact same steps for the right renal artery. And again, we got a good angiographic result. And then we proceeded with incorporation of the celiac axis after exchanging for a stiffer wire. And we used balloon expandable stent grafts, the, via, uh, the VBX stent grafts, to incorporate uh, the celiac and the SMA. I'm going to let the video play out a little bit here because uh, there's another thing I think uh, 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 some of us will find quite interesting. And maybe we can start incorporating here as well. Uh, once we can uh, perform our completion DSA, um, we'll see it here in a second after we incorporate the celiac, and here you can see again a good angiographic result. So once we in incorporate our C CTA, we perform an on-table cone beam CT scan, and this allows for immediate uh, a review of uh, patient's anatomy while you still have wire access. You can ensure that there's no uh, obvious type 1A or uh, type 1 or type 3 endoleak, and you can also uh, ensure that your, st your bridging stents don't have any kinks or compressions that you may not appreciate on our DSA. So uh, uh, we do have a case where we uh, uh, looked at the coronal cuts, and there was a median accurate ligament compression of the celiac. The SMA stent also had a compression, and we also already had wire access. We went back in, and we, we reinforced those. So this patient did really well. This patient did OK, um, was in the ICU for 16 days, uh, uh, required respiratory support. Ultimately, tracheostomy was placed on post-op day 17, no neurologic deficits and was discharged uh, a month later on aspirin and Plavix. You can see the post-op CT scan already had shrinkage to 98 millimeters at post-op day 25. And interestingly, without doing anything else, uh, platelets had uh, trended up to over 100,000. So I think there probably was a consumptive process going on. But this was an interesting case. I think the overall point is this is a, a very complex case. You could see that there was a previous stent graft in place that it was obscuring everything. And without having preloaded Ys in place, I don't think we would have completed the repair. And this is just a summary illustration of the repair. So moving on to upper extremity access in particular, you can see here there are several advantages to upper extremity access. This is one example where you see the celiac and the SMA, even the renals are actually down going. So coming in from the femoral approach, you would actually have to use a reverse curve catheter and get into these, which can be done. Dr. Manunga makes it look easy every day that he does it. Um, but um, Coming from the arm, you've got a straight shot into these down-going uh, or cordially-oriented vessels. 
Uh, the other uh, advantage is you maintain a, a smaller sheath in, the f in at least one of the femoral arteries, and then you can actually perform early limb reperfusion by closing your groins after you deploy your um, main stent graft and work exclusively from the arm. And this has benefits for, for spinal cord uh, reperfusion and is, is one of uh, the strategies to, uh, uh, for spinal cord protection. But there are some limitations, especially working from the left side. Um, it can affect workflow. You see you have, you, you have to be on both sides of the table. Depending on how the room's set up, your screen may not be a, in a good position. You have to reposition the screen when you go from the groin and then again when you go from the arm. And then if uh, arch anatomy isn't good, um, here we have a type 3 arch, but if you have thrombus or debris, there's an inherent risk of stroke when you're crossing the arch or even when you're going from the left side. So. Um, I have uh, uh, an interest in this. I've uh, um, uh, uh, done a couple of uh, uh, projects on upper extremity uh, outcomes for fenestrated repair. This was presented in 2016 or 17. And so um, uh, this is the study. We, uh, uh, upper extremity access is often needed for catheterization of cordially oriented vessels, as I mentioned. But we always worry about cerebral embolization as well as uh, uh, risks, uh, inherent risks of cutting down and manipulating the brachial artery, so uh, uh, arterial injuries as well as peripheral nerve injuries. So the aim of this study was to evaluate the outcomes of FBVA using upper extremity access with small and large sheaths. Um, we reviewed a prospectively maintained database. We looked at thoracoabdominal aneurysms, pararenal aneurysms. And our um, outcomes were access-related complications, which included any stroke or TIA, uh, any arterial complications resulting in symptoms, and they're listed here, peripheral nerve injury, and then wound-related complications. Uh, we looked at a total of 334 patients, included 230, uh, 243 were included in our study and had uh, fenestrated repair with upper extremity access. And here's the breakdown uh, uh, by anatomy. And this is uh, the technique uh, that we used. And we use a similar technique here. Um, so uh, in those days, we preferred left-sided access because there was this idea that if you cross the arch with right-sided access, you, you have an inherent risk of, uh, you have a higher inherent risk of uh, uh, cerebral embolism. So left-sided access whenever possible. Um, typically for big 10 or 12 French sheets, which are usually required for these cases, we would use the uh, proximal brachial artery. If we had small brachial arteries, we would go in through the uh, uh, axillary artery, always ultrasound beforehand because sometimes you can get fooled and someone has a really diminutive uh, brachial artery and then uh, as a trainee you get um, uh, slaughtered by your attending. So this was a, this was a key step. Um, for access technique, we, we perform a small incision. All patients had a surgical exposure. Then we use a micropuncture needle to gain access after gaining silastic vessel loop control of the artery proximally and distally. Uh, we then, over a stiff wire, advance a 12 French uh, sheath and a single pass to the mid descending thoracic aorta, and then we utilize this to cannulate our target vessels. For closure, again, we have silastic vessel loop control. We withdraw the sheath, and then we either performed a primary repair with interrupted 7 0 prolines. In the case of focal dissection, there's a little bit more work to be done, so we open the arteriotomy longitudinally identified the dissection flap, we resected any intima if it needed to be resected, and if it couldn't be tacked down, tacked down any residual intimal flaps if we needed to, uh, and then perform bovine uh, uh, patch angioplasty to ensure there was no stenosis or, or, or issue with the uh, brachial artery. So um, 212 patients had primary closure, 30 patients had a bovine patch, uh, um, and one patient had a, a vein into position graft. One of the comments that was made uh, both during presentation and uh, when we submitted this manuscript was, why do you guys patch so many arteries? And we said, well, we were aggressive with patching. And you'll see that we actually had um, um, zero um, post-operative access-related complications. So eight, uh, or we had uh, zero in instances of post-operative uh, uh, occlusion, um, pseudoaneurysm, stenosis, or any sort of uh, uh, ischemia-related complication uh, after the uh, OR. And I think that's because we were so um, aggressive with performing patch angioplasty if there was uh, ever any doubt that the artery had been injured. So eight patients or 3% had access-related complications. Those were five strokes, two, uh, episode, or two incidents of neuropraxia, one hematoma that came from a sub-Q skin bleeder. And as I mentioned, no pseudoaneurysm, stenosis, thrombosis, or distal, distal embolization and no loss of upper extremity patency during our follow-up. 
Um, there were five patients who had stroke, as I mentioned. Three were minor, two were major. Uh, two patients had uh, asymptomatic cerebral emboli. Um, and uh, right upper extremity access, in this study at least, was associated with more strokes compared to left upper extremity access. So we concluded by this study that upper extremity arterial access <coughs> using surgical exposure and larger diameter sheets was associated with a low rate of uh, uh, complication stroke, peripheral nerve injuries in patients treated with FBVAR, and left-sided access was associated with uh, lower stroke rates. Now, this was a very interesting time because at the, at the same time in Europe, there were a lot of studies that looked at right upper extremity access. There were very uh, famous names, Thilo Kobel, uh, Hamburg Group, Stefan Hallon, now in the Paris group, who were all using right upper extremity access in patients who had appropriate anatomy, and they were uh, reporting uh, a very low stroke rate. In addition, they were saying that um, right upper extremity access has a number of uh, advantages. So standing on the right side of the table, and there were a lot of studies that um, actually look into this, standing on the right side of the, of the table in, in a lot of studies, uh, there was lower uh, operated uh, dose radiation, um, operated uh, radiation dose, sorry. Um, it's mo more ergonomically uh, uh, pleasing to the uh, operator. You're not going to the left side of the table. You can tuck the arm to the side of the patient, simulate femoral access. So not only are you on the same side, but you're further away from the, the C arm. Um, it's better for workflow. You don't have to move your, um, your uh, monitors. Um, and so we became interested in this, and we, we figured maybe we should do a study to look at is there really a difference in stroke rates. So um, this was presented at a meeting that I, I actually I got to run into Dr. Sullivan on the streets of London at Charing Cross. I, I didn't even realize he was there, but he was obviously presenting a number of projects. And uh, so we presented outcomes comparing right versus left upper extremity access. Um, and that was the purpose. Again, a retrospective review. This time we had a very, a much larger cohort of right upper extremity access patients. And our primary endpoint was major adverse events, uh, which predominantly was stroke. And then we looked at a couple of other outcomes. One of the interesting things here, and um, um, I'm hoping to talk about this in a few minutes as well, was we sought to classify the arch and really try and stratify patients' risk by arch anatomy. So um, we looked at several characteristics of the arch. Um, and we created a, a grading scale. So um, one of those uh, uh, components was arch type. For a type one arch, you got zero points. For a type two, you got one point. And for type three, you got two points for a maximum of two points. And then we did the same thing with thrombus type, whether it was smooth or uh, uh, um, uh, finger-like projections. Uh, the thickness of the thrombus, uh, the surface area of the thrombus, uh, and the um, circumference of the thrombus, and there was a maximum composite score of 10. And again, we came up with this arbitrary grading scale of mild being 0 to 3, moderate being 4 to 7, severe being 8 to 10. And again, this is not based on anything. It was, it was an arbitrary grading scale. We wanted to see what would happen. So um, uh, we uh, had 99% technical success for this uh, study, um, equal for the left upper extreme. Well, uh, sorry, not equal. Um, 99% uh, versus 92% for right, left upper extremity versus uh, right upper extremity. Again, there were only 65 patients in the uh, uh, right upper extremity group. Um, in terms of major adverse events, uh, there were no uh, differences in death, no differences in MA any major adverse event, uh, and no differences in any individual major adverse event. When we looked at embolic stroke, uh, a total of five patients had embolic strokes. Four patients had strokes ipsilateral uh, to the access, uh, the upper extremity access site. Uh, and then when we look at our, um, when we look at our um, grading scale, you can see that four of the strokes, or 80%, had type three arches. One of the strokes had a type two arch. Zero had a favorable type one arch. And we didn't really see any other trends. There were so few patients who had strokes. So we didn't really see any other trends in uh, any of the other characteristics. So when we look um, at the uh, uh, total score, um, you can see that most people scored any in, in the moderate range, anywhere between 4 and 7. Again, I don't think we could draw any conclusions from, from five patients, but I think this was something that prompted us to, to think about starting a bigger study. So uh, the conclusions were that right and left upper extremity access had similar rates of cerebroembolic complications and procedural metrics. One of the procedural metrics was radiation dose, and this was lower for right upper extremity access. This was just because 
we started performing this on later on in our uh, experience. Um, and so the, there was obviously a learning curve uh, and improvement with uh, radiation uh, a dose later on in our experience. The majority of strokes occurred with the uh, unfavorable type 3 aortic arch. Now this is a case, I think we have some time um, to show, which kind of puts everything together. Um, um, so we can go over this. It's a 78-year-old male who had a Debakey type 1 dissection, was repaired with an AVR and uh, ascending aortic repair, subsequently had an EVAR, left hypogastric embolization. So now is probably high risk for spinal cord ischemia. You can see his uh, cardiovascular risk factors listed there. Um, and this study, uh, this case, you'll actually see, puts everything together, upper extremity access, preloaded system, manufactured devices. This is his diagnostic workup. He has some uh, a mild to moderate aortic regurgitation. Ejection fraction is 60%. On his pre-op CT scan, you can see the uh, dissecting thoracobdominal aneurysm. The celiac access comes off the uh, true lumen. The SMA comes off the true lumen. And the bilateral renal arteries, as well as a uh, uh, right accessory renal artery, come off the true lumen. There's uh, opacification of the false lumen there. The EVAR is basically doing nothing. And there's an em a coil embolized a hypogastric artery. So they were sent to uh, a Mayo Clinic when I was there, and we planned for a stage repair. Again, TVAR, uh, and then using um, a custom manufactured device with five uh, fenestrations um, and a uh, preloaded system. So I'm going to pause the video here. We don't need to go through all of it, but I wanted to kind of go over this um, uh, preloaded system. If you look closely at this diagram, this uh, uh, a device was manufactured with wires. If you look at the, um, the bottom of the screen here, I don't know if you can see my point, you can. The wire comes uh, along the outside of the device, goes in through the renal fenestration, goes up through the inside of the device, makes a loop that's housed in the top cap, and then comes back down the inside of the device and comes out um, the SMA branch. And then the same thing is true of the uh, other renal. The, device, the, the wire goes up the outside of the device, goes inside the renal fenestration, traverses the inside of the device, makes a loop which is housed in the top cap, and then comes back down the inside of the device and comes out the celiac fenestration. Now, the interesting thing about this is um, you have two, only two wires, but when we externalize these wires, they can actually be cut. Uh, and it's a little bit harder to describe uh, by words, we'll, we'll look at the video. So here you can see, again, we did this in an operating room, uh, hybrid operating room. We got bilateral percutaneous femoral access. You can see the CT fusion here, which was key. Um, we uh, gained a a left upper extremity access, uh, snared a brachial wire to establish through and through brachial femoral access, and then catheterized the left renal artery. This allows us to calibrate the fusion. Sometimes the fusion is off so we can adjust those markers. We then passed in a single pass a 12 French uh, gore dry seal flexor sheath. And then we oriented the device, which you can see has an extremely long delivery system. Um, the nose cone is eight French, uh, and this uh, progressively gets bigger down the main body of the device. You can see here we're first extracorporeally orienting the device, and then in inserting this over the through and through brachiofemoral wire. As we insert this over the through and through brachiofemoral wire, you will actually see the nose cone, which houses those two loops of the wires I showed you before, gets externalized from the brachial sheath. We then take off the cap of that nose cone, which re reveals the two loops of those brachial wires, or those preloaded wires. We cut each loop. This turns the two loops into four separate wires that are now preloaded for immediate access into all four of those target vessel fenestrations or branches. So now we're deploying, uh, as I showed you in the other case, to just below the celiac axis, we can advance our sheets straight over that preloaded wire out of the fenestration without even thinking about having to catheterize the fenestration first. Uh, and then we, the only task we have left is to use a, a buddy catheter and wire to catheterize the uh, celiac axis uh, and, and the other target vessels. And you can see now we're on the right renal artery. We then um, advance our stent, uh, uh, ICAR stent into place, complete deployment of the device as you see here. And then the delivery system is removed. We use a, a, a bifurcated device to extend uh, distally. In this case, it was an inverted limb. 
uh, we then reperfuse the low extremities. So now that we've deployed the main body, we no longer need the, need the low extremities. We can reperfuse them and allow um, uh, the collaterals to be reperfused to the spinal cord. And we work exclusively from the arm, incorporating the renal arteries. You can see a good angiographic result with the right renal artery. We do the exact same thing with a balloon expandable covered stent for the left renal artery with a good angiographic result. The accessory renal we incorporated with a, a bare metal coronary stent. Uh, uh, and then we moved on to the SMA, followed by the celiac axis. And then a completion angiography sh showed widely patent repair, no obvious endo leak. We performed cone beam CT scan. And on this case, you'll actually see, as we reviewed this in the back room, on axial cuts, everything looked open. There was no endo leak. But you could see that there was compression or kinking of these, uh, the celiac and SMA stent. So we actually put reinforcing stents there. While we st still had access, didn't rec recognize this in the OR, so a patient didn't require a second trip. And this is the post-op CT scan. You can see widely patent visceral stents and renal stents. There's a small type 1, uh, type 2 endo leak. Um, so uh, a patient did well. And this is a, um, a summary of his repair. So this brings me to some current uh, research, or one current research project that actually we're working with, um, with our uh, uh, cardiology colleagues. And I think some of, some of them are here uh, today. We haven't really got it off the ground yet, but um, we've got a plan in place. So um, based on uh, a, a couple of the projects I've previously done on upper extremity access and the risk of cerebroembolism and, and thinking about um, comparing right and left upper extremity access, um, we sought to actually better classify the arch and really stratify people based on their anatomy. So the aim of this study is to evaluate the incidence of stroke after TVAR and TAVR and to determine anatomic characteristics of the aortic arch that predispose patients to stroke. So the plan, um, so far we've, uh, uh, we've got probably over 1,000 patients thanks to, uh, thanks to uh, the TAVR program, TVAR I think we I don't know, Dr. Manunga, how many patients do you think we have with TVAR? 178. 178, so a very, a very small amount of the patients. Um, we're, we'll exclude those with cerebral protection, such as a sentinel device. Um, we'll look at the pre-op CTA under centerline flow of imaging. And then we'll use this uh, classification system that I, I brought up previously. So looking at the arch type, the thrombus type, uh, the thickness of the thrombus, the surface area of the thrombus, uh, the circumference of the thrombus and try and uh, um, score these patients. And um, hopefully with over a 1,000 patients, um, we'll see enough strokes that we, well, unfortunately, we, we may see enough strokes. Fortunately and unfortunately, we may see enough strokes uh, that we can uh, uh, come up with a, uh, a classification system and, and try and get some guidance on um, when to use a sentinel device during a TAVR, how to counsel our patients during TVAR, uh, whether patients should have upper extremity access during a fenestrated repair, whether we should go total femoral approach and avoid upper extremity access. I think it's going to be a, a great project, and I'm excited to work on it with, uh, with uh, everyone. Uh, these are my references. And uh, as things began uh, with my mentor, Dr. Oderich, uh, uh, they've finished with, uh, with uh, Dr. Mananga and my partners here. Um, so uh, I think... Uh, uh, we'll finish at this point, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, yes, Dr. Skeik. Well, uh, great presentation. We're very honored to have you here. Uh, mm -hmm. You have such a wonderful uh, partner with a lot of expertise, and you bring uh, great uh, skills to our institution. Thank you. So the case that uh, that uh, thrombocytopenia, the guy that came with thrombocytopenia, were you worried about starting aspirin plavics uh, before he left, or how did you monitor? Yeah, him? you know we we did consider it. Um, he had been on aspirin anyway, um, you know, beforehand for uh, uh, patency of his uh, alignment stents. Uh, in general, and uh, we do the same thing here for um, fenestrations. Um, patients are just on aspirin, unless there's a single renal artery, and then we're a bit more aggressive when we consider adding Plavix, and I would say probably Plavix is the right thing to do. In this case, there was so much metal in this, in this patient's uh, uh, renal mesenteric arteries, and we used inner branches. In general, for inner branches, especially for renal arteries, uh, the literature would suggest that uh, patency rates are lower compared to renal fenestrations, and so we're a bit more aggressive on antiplatelet therapy. 
I think because we found a reason for him to uh, 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 potentially have be thrombocytopenic with this occult endo leak, whatever it may have been from, uh, and we we our hypothesis was that it was consumptive, and we had technically um, addressed that issue. We thought it was safe, but we did we did trend his platelets out, and he did okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Wonderful presentation. Are your current fenestrated stent grafts with wires already in place? And are you creating some of these on the back table, or are these available to you? And then the final thing is, how much does registration of CT with what you have save you time and help you? So uh, thank you. Those are good questions. Uh, the first question, um, typically here we haven't used preloaded wires. I think there are, there are certain drawbacks to preloaded wires, especially if you're able to do these cases efficiently from the groin, um, which, which Jesse does them at lightning speed from the groin. So um, one of the drawbacks is that you have to have a larger caliber sheet to allow room for these preloaded wires. Um, and that means that in patients who don't have perfect access vessels, um, now you're compromising a little bit. So you have to have very good access vessels. You have to use a larger caliber uh, 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 profile device or outer sheath of the device to accommodate the, uh, uh, the preloaded wires. And then, of course, you have to use uh, upper extremity access. So we traditionally haven't used uh, preloaded wires here. Now that we're doing a lot more um, failed EVAR cases, preloaded wires um, uh, are beneficial in some cases because they, they uh, facilitate that step of getting out through the fenestration. Um, and I think if, if we start getting a lot of uh, uh, um, failed fenestrateds and we're starting to have to reline those, um, then they'll be essential. Um, but uh, at this point, if we do require preloaded wires, uh, we have to add them ourselves on the back table. Um, for the second question in terms of uh, uh, registra registering the fusion or calibrating the fusion, Usually we get uh, you know preoperative CT angiogram with one millimeter cuts or uh, uh, 0.5 millimeter cuts and they're very accurate and Dave K does a great job in in um, putting the markers in place for us and usually when we get a two point registration uh, um, with the with the flora with the C arm pre uh, when the patient's on the table um, those markers are usually in good position relative to each other. You just have to shoot an angiogram beforehand to uh, make sure they're positioned correctly on the patient, and then once you've uh, once you've done that, you you can kind of shift the markers to where they need to be. One of the caveats is though, once you get a stiff wire and, and a stiff system in place, and then you start putting a stent graft in place, sometimes the aneurysm anatomy or the aortic anatomy can shift and become a little bit distorted, and so occasionally those those uh, markers are a little bit off, and then we recalibrate recal during the case. But otherwise, uh, they're pretty good, and um, I think they're really important for a few things. One of, the, one of them is um, you minimize uh, radiation, or you decrease radiation, because you're not, and, and contrast dye, because you're not constantly uh, performing DSA or, or floral loops to identify where your target vessels are and confirm that you're fishing around in the right place when you're trying to catheterize these target vessels. Yes, sir. What do we know about the long-term patency of the... Uh when we do these? So um, that's a great question. Um, for fenestrations and for branches, the patency rates for celiac and the SMA are quite high, um, probably 98% and greater in most series. Um, for the renal arteries, it's a little bit different. There have been several studies that have looked at fenestrations versus branches. In general, fenestrations, patency rate, again, I would say is 95% and greater. There have been several studies done in Europe. Uh, Tara Mastracci did a uh, combined study with Stefan Holon, so the London group and the uh, Paris, the now Paris group was previously the Lille group, but they did a study looking at fenestrations and branches and found that there was a lower patency rate for branches versus fenestrations. Um, when I was at Mayo, we did a study uh, looking at that and also looked at renal anatomy, and, and we found that if you select the right patients for branches, uh, the uh, patency rates for branches and fenestrations in renal arteries are equivalent. So I think the key is that uh, patency rates are upwards of 95% and greater. Um, but when you're incorporating renal arteries, you really have to be cognizant of the anatomy. Um, and branches can be used in renal arteries as long as they're the appropriate patient with the appropriate anatomy. Yes, Dr. Sullivan. I mean, that was outstanding. Um, for the audience, um, you know, I'll be very humble. Um, was probably the most sought-after graduating fellow in the country. You know, 
so we're very, very fortunate to, uh, to have him here. Got a, uh, a comment and then a question. So it seems to me that, that vascular surgery is becoming more like a video game. And, <laughs> and I was never good at Call of Duty when I tried to play with my kids, and so it's probably a good thing that I'm, I'm stepping away. Um, the question is, you know, these are clearly better for patients than open thoracal abdominal repair. Um, the concern over time is going to be cost. So for these complex repairs, what do you estimate the, the device cost is for this? Uh, we're talking on, uh, on the scale of tens of thousands of dollars, at very minimum, just for main body devices. Uh, and then when you're looking at more complex repairs and adding in uh, uh, iliac artery aneurysm repairs and you're you're now looking at centers that are doing uh, uh, hypogastric or uh, iliac branch devices with these. Um, you add in the cost of the bridging stents, um, like the VBX or the ICAST. I mean, all of these things adds, add up. And so you're looking at a, a repair that, you know, in some patients is, uh, you know, $100,000 uh, for an institution. Um, so the device cost is, is definitely there. Absolutely worth it, though. It's worth, it's worth it. Uh, I, I mean... We've also had studies that have looked at, um, you know, survival of these patients, but also quality of life for these patients. And interestingly, when you compare quality of life for an endovascular <laughs> repair to uh, a thoracoabdominal repair, it's certainly much better for an endovascular repair. But interestingly, when you compare someone's preoperative quality of life score to their postoperative quality of life score, even for an endovascular approach, there's definitely a decrease. And I think you cannot deny the stress that someone undergoes uh, when you're repairing a thoracoabdominal aneurysm, regardless of whether you're doing it open or endo, it's still a, a huge operation and a, and, and a physiologic stress or change on the body. Um, and these patients, um, they're not living for 30, 40 years. A lot of these patients who aren't open candidates and were traditionally then funneled off to the endovascular uh, uh, approach were you know, you know, 70, 80, now 90-year-old patients in some cases. And they're, they're, uh, they're living for, you know, two, five, I think if someone lives out to 10, 10 years, we're, 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 you know, throwing a party. So um, those are all things to be consider as well. But I think for families and for uh, uh, the overall picture, this is, uh, it's definitely worth it for patients. And we're definitely doing people and families a lot of good. Yes, Dr. Manunga. Great presentation, Ali. My, uh, just wanted to, uh, just to clarify a couple of questions. Um, the first is Dr. Uh, Lesser. There are advantages, and just like Dr. Merza showing, disadvantages of uh, doing a brachial approach or coming from the arm to deploy this, uh, this device. The biggest disadvantage is the number of um, help you need. So uh, essentially, you're relying on a through and through wire that comes from the groin and the arm. And it's not uncommon to have six wires at the same time, eight wires during this procedure. And you're relying that everybody understands where these wires are because pulling it out of a millimeter or two uh, can set you back by a number of hours to try to get back into it. Uh, so the person in the arm has to be pulling the wire in an equal amount of force as the person in a groin during a through and through system. Um, at the same time, then you have the other wires, that person up above has four other wires, and the person down below has two wires, and they have to keep everything in mind because you're so busy trying to get into these, these branches. It makes it a bit challenging. And this is the reason why, if you, you talk about the European group, Stefano Lon has abandoned it, to come down working from, from, the, from below. Having said that, in cases of dissections, um, we had a, a, a gentleman uh, that came to us with a symptomatic aneurysm uh, referred to us by one of our fellows last, I think, two weeks ago, Dr. Ojo. And in that case, where you have a trilumen and false lumen and everything is compressed, you can't really get into it. Preloading the system, that's how we did it. We preloaded it, and then we sequentially deployed it coming down. Uh, it's a great system. I think it has to be used selectively, and you have to look at your resources, and you have to look um, whether, uh, you know, you have, so at the Mayo Clinic, you have these fellows that are grilled in, 
into these things and, and they'll understand and and, uh, and you have all the help, the staff has all the help we can get. And it's not like that in other systems. Uh, the, your question, Doctor, um, about the patency, renal artery patency. So there used to be good people in vascular surgery used to question the rationale of taking a stent, putting it in a good, clean vessel. It's like, are you kidding me? Why would I put a stent in a renal artery? Are they even gonna stay open? Well, we do have the results now, now going up to 15, 12 years, published that these arteries are staying patent, especially fenestration. Fenestration have a 98% patency, 10 year result uh, in Europe. Uh, so, and um, branches have a slightly lower patency than fenestrations, but at least you can come back from the arm, get into it and balloon it again. So, so time has proven that these, these things do stay patent. And the second thing, is that these, like Dr. Mirza uh, just said, these are sick people. They have a number of other diseases, and our goal is to prolong life and, and, and give them three years to four years, and a lot of them are dead after that um, from, from other diseases, from other conditions. Oh. Yeah, at, at, uh, in training, if you're not holding tension on the through and through wire, you get murdered. And actually, there was a there was a saying that he used to that he used to say to us was he used to say take that diet uh, take the wire tie to the door and close the door, and then he also used to say uh, he also used to tell us to hold the mother of all tensions on the wire and if you let up, um, you're in trouble. But uh, it, I mean, we've seen it here. If you don't hold tension on the through and through wire, um, when you're putting things up like a coda balloon, that coda balloon can prolapse, and now you're in trouble because you have got an inflated balloon that's prolapsed with inside a stent graft. And I think you do. You have to have a team, but you have to have a team that's um, that's invested in 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 what you're doing. A dedicated team, someone who's familiar with these repairs, and someone um, someone who's going to be there and 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 really be, you know, knowledgeable about what you're doing. Even if they're not the ones, you know, deploying the stents or deciding, you know, making clinical decisions, um, but they need to have a good a good fund of background knowledge to be able to participate in these when we have preloaded wires. Otherwise. You're left in a difficult situation with a preloaded wire pulled out.